meeting to order. If uh, Bill joins us, that's great. Um, if not, uh, we can continue. We do have a, a quorum. So uh, this meeting is being recorded, uh, but because it's all Zoom, um, I will be taking roll. I always take roll. I think it's uh, advantageous um, and it helps the, uh, the uh, people who are uh, taking the minutes. So when I call your name, would you please indicate that you're present? Pat Norton? Present. Jonathan Poor. Jonathan Poor, present. Beth Herr. Beth Herr, you're yeah, muted. Present. There she is. Darcy Dale. Darcy Dale, present. Uh, Matt Hamill. Present. Jeff Austin. Present. And Marnie Crouch, present. So we have um, quite a full uh, agenda this evening, but I don't think any particular item should um, take us too long. I hope you all um, were able to read um, the memorandum that I sent around yesterday, as well as the one I sent around from last week. But uh, the first item I would like to bring up is the implementation committee. And so we had uh, made a preliminary list of uh, representatives of boards and committees that we thought should be um, on the implementation committee. Uh, but I thought about it a little more and um, also looked at the implementation charts and the identity of the uh, board or commission or individual in, in town offices uh, who would be the lead in implementing the various tasks that are set forth in those implementation charts. So um, right now I have a list uh, of uh, uh, 11 individuals that I think probably should be on the implementation committee. And they would be the town manager, the planning director, a representative of the DPW, um, and a representative of the recreation department. And then um, in addition to those town offices, if you will, uh, this, uh, someone from the select board, the planning board, the conservation commission, the capital committee, the finance and the Advisory Committee, uh, Hamilton Development Corporation, and the Environmental Impact Committee. Um, does anyone want to comment on those 11 individuals and, and agree or disagree with that list? I'd like to know what the HDC would be, um, what their role would be. Well, to the extent that we have a form-based code, I know that they have been um, uh, providing some funding for that. And if we do have, as part of the form-based code, recommendations as to how to improve the streetscape, mm -hmm. again, the uh, Hamilton Development Corporation might be in a position to uh, provide funding for that effort. Well, you know they get our meals tax 100% every year. Right, I know they do. Yeah. So, so it would be helpful if they were <laughs> part of the um, uh, uh, process of spending the money that they get mm -hmm. to improve the town. And so, um, that, be that was my thinking of putting them on that because they do. Uh, I think they provide the funding for the flowers, the, the hanging baskets, and things like that. So, you know, they do have an ability to raise money that might be more difficult um, without grants. Uh, for other um, boards, commissions, and town government. They have likely the the largest role in economic development focus for our downtown of anyone or any entity. So I think from that perspective, I think they're they're important to be at the table. Okay, I'm gonna poll our members. Jonathan, what do you think? I would agree with Patrick. Well, I'm talking about the 11. Oh, uh, the 11. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. You know, I think that um, e this is sort of an indicator of who the, the parties are. And I would hope that if a process came up where they needed a different expertise that wasn't listed here, that they would just pull that party in. Well, well, and and maybe I we could have a statement to that to that effect. 
Absolutely. And so what I did is I, I went through, as I said, the implementation charts. So the second, well, the third column, if you will, are other leadership parties that were in the charts. And that was the, someone from the Council on Aging, the Emergency Management Service, Energy Commission, the Affordable Housing Trust, the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee, the Historic District Commission, the IT department and the ZBA. So you're right. I think that the 11 um, parties, if you will, that I've listed are probably should be a permanent and then maybe bring in um, the others that I've listed on an as needed basis. Mm -hmm. Right, and there could be a statement to that effect with that intent. And it could even have a statement as well that if if they need expertise that isn't in, included in the town, any of the town bodies, that they need to go outside of the town or to a consultant for it. Right, okay, so you're kind of on board with that. Um, Pat, what do you think? I just wanted, the, the, the one thing I would caution is this the rule by committee um approach is a committee rarely has individuals responsible like that whole um a direct responsibility for a discrete task so just making sure that there's a there's a small group of people responsible for the overall and then smaller groups that identify it as the executors it, it may not be that you need every one of the people that you listed in any one of the initiatives but again it, it a committee tends to rely on a committee and, and never, it, it, it's hard to get things done as part of it. Well, if you remember in the implementation charts, say the planning board is charged with doing mm -hmm. any number of tasks, but I look at the implementation committee is, is really a committee that can look at mm -hmm. the status of where we are as a town and maybe provide some guidance. So on the second page of the memorandum, I had mm -hmm. the questions that we could ask ourselves as to how this committee should function. So if you go to page two, yeah. I have four questions that yeah. we should consider. And the, the first thing I think is, is rather than designating a particular person, um, any select board member could attend an implementation committee meeting and then report back to the select. Um, so we don't really have to charge an individual the way we've charged you, Darcy, with going to the um, uh, TPC. Out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you're you're designated for that. So if you can't make it, there's no one from the planning board that, mm -hmm. unless you were to ask, would fill your uh, seat. Uh, but here I'm thinking it, it might actually be really beneficial to have a mix of people rotate them anyone, rotating through with different ideas. Hmm. Thoughts on that? I, I, th good. I thought that I thought that Emil did it. I, I think I would like to re like the there's there's pillars within the plan and I think there's smaller groups of people that get responsible for pillars and oh yes, yes. like one or two or three individuals responsible for the overall. So I think, it, again, it, to include everyone who's got a stake in whatever might be just, you know, provided as part of the plan, managing the plan, I think is the is, is not the right approach. Well, I don't think this is in terms of managing. I look at it in terms of, you know, say, for example, the planning board wants to uh, redo the estate overlay district. Mm -hmm. So we could do that work, and then you go to an implementation committee meeting, and the question becomes, how can we help you do that? And the town manager says, well, I authorize you to employ town council to review your work product. Not managing it per se, but facilitating it. So, so one of the things that this implementation committee can do is provide um, interaction between these boards and committees and, and kind of develop partnerships so that um, that that the implementation of the plan can be facilitated through the exchange of expertise and ideas, not to manage any particular thing, because we've identified the lead player 
or players for each of the tasks in those charts. Does that think, make sense to you, yeah, Pat? Yeah, definitely. And, and, and you highlighted probably the most important outcome of what you've highlighted there is having transparency amongst the boards and who's doing what. Because I think that is the one uh, critique anyone might have of, of the boards individually operating kind of in silo form to, you know, we're all kind of working towards the same goal. In the exactly, end. exactly. That, I think that is an un unintended benefit maybe to what you're describing in the, some additional transparency. Well, you know, sometimes just getting to know different people on these boards and committees, mm -hmm. you, you know, they, 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 there's so many resources that our volunteers have, but they're sometimes not able to share it. It might not be something that they can bring, say, to the planning board, but they might have something that they could lend in terms of expertise or ideas to the Conservation Commission or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, for example, you're very uh, up to date on the uh, wastewater treatment center at your employment. <laughs> so, you know, you could maybe share some of those ideas um, to the extent we ever want to, you know, look at some of the the, um, the GPOD or anything like that. And, and that would also benefit the Conservation Commission if they were involved in this process as, as well. So, so I think if I'm reading this correctly, there's consensus that we don't necessarily want to have one specific representative identified that we actually think it's a benefit to have a, a rotating cast of characters in the implementation committee. Mm -hmm. and, and let's be realistic. This, would pro this implementation committee would probably meet a maximum of four times of a year and probably mm -hmm. more likely two times a year. So it's not, it's not going to be onerous, but at the same token, a lot of people have constraints on their time and they, they just don't want to be that involved. I mean, if they're already involved in one board, they may not want to be involved in another. So, um, and, then, and then the question is whether the implementation committee will have the authority to vote on matters related to the master plan or a proposed amendment to it. And so really, I, the thrust of this is not so much to vote on what any specific board or committee is charged with doing, but I think it would be helpful uh, if the implementation committee could authorize an amendment to the master plan, say in five years or at any point in time when some predicate that that was foundational to our master plan changed or changed dramatically. So thoughts on that? I have a question, Marnie, on that. So where do the committees derive their power and how does that happen? Well, Darcy answered that question at our last meeting. The, so, the select board, board would be charged with forming the committee and they would obtain their power um, so then the power, then the select board would decide what what the parameters of the authority that they're operating under. Is that right. right? But yeah. what I'm what I'm suggesting through these questions is that that we draft a letter to the select board right. setting forth our ideas in as cogent a manner as possible and mm -hmm. asking mm -hmm. them to form the committee. Uh, with that understanding. Now, that's not to say they won't True. do something else. The but, other the other comment I have is <clears throat> I like the idea of having um, people rotate because that's great, um, especially if we have videos of our meetings because then people can watch. My concern is if you don't have consistency with people, and there's no ability to see what happened in the last meeting, except for the minutes. I feel like there could be like nuances that are missed. And um, I do think that that could be a bit of a challenge. So I like the flexibility. I just am pointing out that. Um, but if we had a video and we could watch it ahead of time and know the conversations and I wouldn't, that wouldn't be an issue. Does so you're sense? suggesting that the meetings be recorded and minutes are taken. Right. Yeah, definitely minutes. But I mean, I think the 
the videos like I'll read our minutes and then I'll watch a video and there's a lot of different things that I could pick up on. Um, well, in, in, in the set, you're asking also that the, the meetings be public meetings. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, a hundred percent. Okay. Um, and I don't have a problem with that um, because, well, we'll speak about it later, but as, as you know, from, Joe Demolovitz's email, um, the Conservation Commission and the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District have been uh, sued. And, you know, I found, you know, that there's, it's, unless you attend a Conservation Commission meeting, uh, I don't know that there is a recording, or if there is a recording, I suppose that we have to ask for it through Patrick or someone in town hall. And then the only thing available for their, their meetings, if you don't attend the Zoom meeting, is the minutes because they're not actually uh, video. You know, H doesn't, HW Cam doesn't record their meetings. And, and I think that that's, um, well, I'll say it. I think that's a mistake. I think the Conservation mm -hmm. Commission is a really important a commission in this town. And I think that people, uh, you know, if they had the opportunity would certainly um, uh, be interested in, in uh, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Yeah, so I see what you're saying with respect to having these uh, uh, meetings. Um, it kind of goes back to what Pat was saying about transparency. It, it kind of gives an, a, another level of transparency, which you have to have, in order to have accountability. And I think that's what the people in the town are hungry. Yeah, and you know, I did uh, speak to Bill Melville and if he's here, he can speak for himself. But he did say that um, recording uh, uh, our meetings uh, and then getting them posted to YouTube is no small undertaking. Mm. So that apparently is an issue. Um, so what I will do is if we have consensus, I will prepare um, a letter to the select board and we will uh, review it and finalize it at our next meeting. I won't, um, I won't uh, uh, send it off until uh, everyone on the planning board has an opportunity to uh, see it and make whatever changes they might think are appropriate. Does that sound like a plan? Yep. Do you want someone to make a motion? Um, or... sure, you can make a motion. I don't mind. I mean, I don't know that it needs a motion. Oh, okay, if it doesn't, if... I won't. <laughs> well, no, it never hurts to have a motion. <laughs> okay, I move I move that we send a, uh, a recommendation to the select board that um, we would like to see a committee uh, for the implementation of the master plan. How does that sound? That sounds good. And uh, okay. uh, we will finalize the letter of recommendation for this implementation committee at our next meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Um, Pat Norton. Pat Norton, aye. Jonathan Poor. Jonathan Poor, aye. Beth Herr. Aye. Darcy Dale. Darcy Dale, aye. Marnie Crouch, aye. Uh, so the next uh, item I want to take up is are the um, well, it's the uh, inclusionary housing bylaw, and uh, um, Matt uh, handles uh, changes to the um, inclusionary housing bylaw. And just by way of background, um, uh, David Smith and Suzanne Sofa took the initiative on this as members of the Hamilton Affordable Housing Trust, and they uh, provided some of the um, uh, considerable legwork in getting these changes to the planning board. And uh, uh, Matt, thank you for your efforts. I, I have gone through um, your proposed changes and um, you know I think that what you have done um, could be put in a final form and we can then uh, request that town council uh, review it so that it could be presented to the voters at the annual town meetings. The only changes then I would make um, to your um, draft, your red line draft. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with you that uh, it, it's advisable to 
create a new section 8.3.3 um, segmentation prohibited, that would require the renumbering of the remaining sections. Yep. Um, uh, then for, you know, there's an example that's set forth in the actual body of the bylaw. I would put that in a footnote. I think it might be better in a footnote. Sure. And, and, um, and I noted that the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities um, was, um, was added to the bylaw instead of, quote unquote, the state. And then you used its abbreviation and you did that in the uh, purposes. And I think that that can carry over to the remainder of okay. the bylaw. I think you did it twice. Um, so then um, there is, um, and it's highlighted, and you, I think you had a comment with respect to that, but it's uh, on page two, and it says an applicant should request instructions for locating the relevant HUD uh, AMFI from the town planning director. I think that should be a footnote. And, um, and then we do have to change the definition um, of, well, it's now AMI, but it will be AMFI. We have to, we have to make that change in the definitions. And right now, that definition, I believe, is on page 107, but probably it should be on page 112 where there are definitions that are actually applicable to the inclusionary housing bylaw. Do you okay. agree with that? I don't, know, I don't know why it is where it is, but it would seem to me, if you were looking for a definition in the for what's in the inclusionary housing bylaw, you would look under that in section 11. Um, so then um, in section 8.3.3, Five, which will be renumbered 8.3.6. Um, you have, I did make this one change. Um, it says the selection of qualified purchasers or qualified renters shall be carried out under a marketing plan. It says approved by the planning board. And I'm wondering if that needs to be approved by the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. It does. In order for uh, units to be determined as uh, eligible for uh, registering on the SHI, they have to approve the marketing plan. Right. Yeah, I thought that was the case. So yep. that change, that change has to be made. And then um, again, in, in that 3, 8.3.5, now 8. 3.6, um, the fourth paragraph, we just need to refer to the EOHLC, not the full name. And then finally, in 8.3.6, now 8.3.7, um, we need a period at the end of the paragraph. So those were my comments. Did anybody else have any comments? Uh, Marty, the one thing that I um, didn't include, and I, I I couldn't really find a what seems like a satisfactory spot to put it, um, and something that maybe should be addressed is a deed restriction. Yes, right. But we didn't touch on that, and I was I was hoping for maybe some input as to what where that would go because I I'm not sure if it would be a new section or if it could fit within the general provision section. Were kind of my two thoughts. Well, I know that the, that a deed restriction is required. Mm -hmm. Now, in the past, uh, like in Ricker Circle, mm -hmm. the deed restriction was only for 30 years, and some of those residents have uh, uh, benefited from that 30-year uh, mm -hmm. restriction because now they can sell their houses at fair market value. Right. Uh, with respect to the... Willow Street Flats, the um, the 
uh, other uh, the Habitat for Humanity project on Asbury and the Habitat for Humanity homes, the two homes on Asbury. Those deeds restrictions are um, uh, permanent. Uh, that they, they run with the land and, and are, are in perpetuity. So Patrick, maybe you can enlighten me on this, or maybe this is a question that we can uh, pose to town council, whether that actually has to be in this bylaw or um, I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be added. And it, let's see, where could it go? So, It might be under methods of providing affordable units in 8.3.4, now 8.3.5. Yep. Um, yeah, that might make sense. And then just that as the last sentence, any um, inclusionary housing units approved under this section shall be deed restricted in perpetuity mm. as affordable units deed mm. restricted as affordable units in perpetuity yep okay i can make that change okay so um did anyone else have any comments patrick do you were you satisfied with this uh as as um uh, as uh, matt has made the changes we just discussed given your history with uh, the SHI. Did we lose Patrick? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Matt, maybe what we need to do um, is if you could get us a clean copy, we'll yep. go over it one last time at our next meeting, and then, um, then we can vote to approve it. Great. And uh, uh, subject to any comments that town council might uh, recommend, something along those lines. And we can do that at the me next meeting. So if you could give us a clean copy, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. We'll do. Okay. Um, the next item is a, a proposed change, and we have discussed this in the past, to the GPOD. And this is... Uh, probably the simplest amendment uh, one could ever make to a, a zoning bylaw because it's literally swapping um, one word for two, for two words. So um, <coughs> did anyone have any thoughts on this? I know, Jonathan, we, uh, the planning board had talked about this um, in conjunction with the 133 Essex project. Yeah, I guess my question would be, um, do folks on the planning board have questions about why it's important to switch those words? Does it, would it be helpful to have some context? I'm game, yes. Context, okay. So the GPOD was first established um, as a bio or as a study in the 80s and then a bylaw in the 80s. And somewhere in the 90s, um, and the original bylaw talked about 80,000 square feet per dwelling unit. And somewhere in the history of the bylaw, that got switched from dwelling unit to per lot, okay? Which didn't really matter if you were talking about single family houses. But as soon as you talked about cluster housing, it changed the density of things because, because you could have 10 buildings on one lot or 50 buildings on one lot. And the whole purpose of the GPOD is to limit density in the areas where there's um, uh, a recharging of the existing active wells uh, for obvious reasons. Because if you have dense septage, you know, you, you, you could contaminate the groundwater. So that's the basic common sense principle there. So for whatever reason, it got changed and it, it kind of undermined the bylaw whenever it came to cluster housing. And there were some debates around that during um, Patton Ridge and I think during uh, Ken Kent Brook and 133 Essex. And so 
the simple solution here is to change it back to dwelling unit. And it and it's also uh, more consistent with the rest of the bylaws because the other bylaws, the other parts of the bylaw talk about dwelling unit, not per lot. Um, so I think it's a fairly simple change. Uh, and but it's only one piece of the GPOD bylaw and the rest of the bylaw really is pretty old at this point. And it's not before us right now, but just a suggestion is that when we have the bandwidth and when the town is willing to, to uh, put some funds toward it, it would be worth revisiting the entire bylaw to make sure that the, the metrics and the performance standards meet today's um, technology in terms of stormwater management strategies and septic design. Does, that, yeah. does that help at all? It does. Thank you. Any any questions for Jonathan or I, I mean it, it it actually makes sense because it's groundwater protection. I mean, this is our drinking water. And um probably as you all are aware, um because of the drought that we're having, um our, our water resources uh are I, I won't maybe use the word imperiled, but they're certainly strained. Um, I drove over the Ipswich River on Asbury Street yesterday and I looked west and there was no river. It mm. was just marsh. And I looked left and the river wasn't flowing. It was just like, almost like a pond. So mm. uh, our, our water situation is... Um, not good, and I think we should protect what we have. <laughs> so um, again, I, I think that everyone can sleep on that and maybe do a little uh, homework about the, the, and read the GPOD, and then we will, at our next meeting, uh, take a vote to uh, send that off to annual town meeting as well. Again, the, the focus of the change is to address the, the, dense, the density implications of cluster housing, not single family housing. Right. Okay, so um, the next um, item, and this is part of the memorandum I sent to you, is the special design process. And um, that Special design process appears at 8.1.12. And uh, I think I might have a typo in there. I think it also appears in the sh uh, senior housing bylaw. So, you know, forgive me if I have a typo in there. I don't know why I have 9.3. Let me double check that. That might be an, another place it's referenced, but it's referenced, I believe, in two places in the senior bylaw. Um, it's referenced in the beginning of the bylaw, and then it's referenced again by implication, I think, in the at the end of it. Yes, you're, you're correct, and I think I put I put that reference at the very end. So that was in 8.2.25.2 and 8.2.31 in the preparatory language. Those are where um, the okay. special design process is mentioned, but it's actually set forth specifically. It's referenced in the senior housing bylaw, but it's set forth specifically in 8.1.12 and 9.3.0. Yes, I'm correct. 9.3.11, 1 through 5. 9.3, I believe, is the estate overlay district. So the special design process is, is also laid out in a similar fashion to the um, um, 8.1.12. Uh, yes, it, it's identical language. Yes. Um, so uh, in conjunction with the Browns Hill Overlay District, we, we were 
considering adding a special design process in the event that a developer elected not to go with the illustrative plans that Jonathan and Emil had prepared. So I wanted to, to reference that special design process, but we know from 133 Essex, there was some discussion about how it, what it meant and the language a little, was a little fuzzy here and there. So what I set forth here is an endeavor to clean that up so that it's unambiguous. But I would like, um, you know, to have a discussion about what I've put down here and whether or not board members agree with me that it's now clear what is required and whether or not um, uh, this uh, special design process should be changed or it, uh, amended in any way, shape or form. So uh, that's a topic uh, for discussion. Uh, if, if you were to just give me your preliminary thoughts, we can, uh, we can delve into this deeper at a at a subsequent meeting, but this is a first uh, mm -hmm. first uh, draft of uh, amending that language. And Pat, you remember from uh, from uh, the one thirty three Essex project how important this special design process was. Yep, I do. Um, I'm looking for language, uh, and and maybe. Kind of just reading it now, but relating to anything might be considered as far as sustainable. You know, we leverage to the greatest extent possible the best design practices. Um, the stormwater bylaw considers, you know, um, I think Emil and Jonathan were always good about trying to bring the project team through that process. But is is the special? That, so I'm I'm just trying to look to see if we've if, if, if this encompasses that effort. Okay, you know I I understand that you know it's difficult for people to. I was going to say do their homework, yeah. but that's <laughs> the, the, so. Um, I think the homework is that at our next meeting, everybody reads this thinks about it and yeah. if you have any proposed language yeah. provide you know provide it to Patrick or and and we'll you know we'll compile everybody's proposed changes and and talk through them because it, you know this is a an opportunity to get it right so let's get it right Jonathan you know what I'm referring to though like the low impact design yes yes so so let me let me make a couple comments that yeah. might be helpful for everyone when they look at this yeah um so um there's a couple components I think that are worth looking at that relate to the special design process the special design process is mostly focused on look at your existing conditions evaluate and map your existing conditions and then respond to your existing conditions. That's a, that's a, like a, a, a very quick summary of what that's about, but it really doesn't cover the concepts of low impact development or smart growth. Mm -hmm. And both of those are somewhat weak in all the rest of the bylaws. Um, so for example, when you look at smart growth, it focuses on, um, clustering and land use, but it, it doesn't at all talk about the principles of um, transportation and walkability. So, so what it does is it tends to, it, it helps support density, but not density in the right place with the right transportation sources. So that's a thing to look at. Um, and that's sort of related to this. And then with low impact development, what you were alluding to there, Patrick, is um, to make sure that people are are looking at the special design process and how it relates to low impact development because it segues right into that. Mm -hmm. Less disturbance means lower impact development means fewer mechanical and engineered solutions to stormwater. So they're all dovetailed. And what I would encourage folks to do is to look at the bylaws through those three lenses, low impact development, the special design process and smart growth. So study those principles and look at the connectivity and the consistency 
of those principles. Is that at all helpful as a way to look at this and think about it? Yes, but and and, and to your point, Jonathan and Pat, your memory's not bad, but the senior housing bylaw had another section, 8.2.13. We can't quite hear you, Marnie. Oh, it had another section, 8.2.13. So so the the, the senior housing bylaw incorporated the special design process in 8.2.25.2, but it had another section called general requirements. And that's where low impact development applied, minimizing disturbance, location of wastewater treatment, paths and trails, um, conversion to apartments, there were other things. Uh, smart growth only appeared in the purposes, I believe. Yes, and it's very weak and very inconsistent with, with smart growth principles. I have a, a, a strong problem with the way it's worded in, in purposes. And then it's also inconsistently worded with the same bent toward density, but not walkability and lo proper location in, in section 8.1, you know, the OS FPD. So, so basically when this was crafted, it, it's well crafted to promote density, but it doesn't temper it with density in the right place, which is what smart growth and this special design process Okay, well, here, here's density and context. Right. So here's the decision point for the for the next meeting. So this special design process that's set forth in our bylaws, I think, could be uh, cleaned up and put to town meeting. But that doesn't really address the more fundamental issue that Jonathan's raising. And it's one that's really set forth in the master plan. And that's looking into amending the open space and farmland development by law, as well as the estate overlay district by law, which both have the special design process. And if we were to do that, um, you know, we could take another look at the senior housing by law as well to try and marry the special I mean, there's a special design process for a reason, and that's to have low impact development and smart growth and the walkability in conjunction with density, right? You've got density to, in the right context, in the right, in the context. right location. That's the so, most important principle, and it's missing in this bylaw as a theme. Density is emphasized and right place is de-emphasized. In right. fact, it's edited out and it's a problem. It right. needs to be fixed systemically. So in other words, what I have put in here is too quick of a fix and we need to look at things much more holistically. So, so you just you just caught caught a, one agenda that I've ever brought to the planning board. If I bring an agenda to the planning board, there it is. Context, context, context. Right. So just remember though that um, it's a big endeavor to- Yes, it is. It's an important violence. endeavor. A yeah. big endeavor and an important endeavor. I almost, I almost, I'm wondering, like, um, as an applicant, you know, we were always like, oh, you didn't follow the process. Like, I think it would be nice to show the expectation in a, almost like a flow chart. Like, first you do this, and then it, the graphically show it. And, and even, you know, I think we missed some opportunity in a special design process that included elements that should have been addressed during the pre-application process, you know, absolutely. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So absolutely. Like, here's where you go, absolutely. here's what you got to do in the pre-application. And before you even get to the point of, we're really considering this thing as part of a, a real project. Absolutely. And this pre-application process, to me, it's everybody shows up. The CONCOM shows up, the Environmental Impact Committee shows up, and they essentially, I won't say they testify, but they put their position on the record so that the applicant doesn't come back and say, oh, we talked to everybody in town and it was fine. No, the, the planning board at the pre-application conference has to be able to, to interact with the uh, other boards and commissions to fully understand what's going on. So I guess the, I guess the consensus here is that um, 
this is too cute by half and it doesn't really address the fundamental issues of, of putting our, the, the actually it's, I would say it's the greatest state overlay district never used. The um, open space and farmland development bylaw never used. You know, fix those two and, and I think also um, I, I, I think the senior housing bylaw can be uh, very much improved. I don't think it needs the absolutely substantial rewrite as the great estate overlay district, which is so cumbersome. I, you know, just read it and you like you're scratching your head. What do I do next? I mean, it's just a recipe for spending enormous sums of money and getting nowhere. Um, and and I think the greatest uh, the open space and farmland development by law also. Uh, can be approved, but I think both of those two require real, real thought. And I think that the senior housing bylaw, I think probably because we're so familiar with it, could be um, really improved without as much work as the other two. Does that again, sound right own, to you? Again, my only comment there would be that putting aside the um, other two bylaws, and just focusing on the senior bylaw, it's still very focused on density and its right, right. I'm, I'm, context. I'm, I'm saying that, you know, to to amend it to yes. reflect and the points that, that you're making. Those three bylaws sort of lean on each other. Those three sections, kind they reference each other, they lean on each other, and they right. work together. And, and right now, they're not working well together. And... Um, it, it, it would be helpful to look at it as a package, but if you only address the senior bylaw, there's things that could be done for that to stand on its own more strongly. Right. All right. So uh, to be continued, I mean, that's, um, I think that endeavor um, may occupy us through uh, all of 2025. I <laughs> could start thinking about it now. And, and at some point, uh, we will have to divvy up the work. Um, so the next item I want to talk about is um, the accessory dwelling units. And I don't know to what extent you have had an opportunity to look at the first pass that I did on accessory dwelling units. And I basically just took our existing bylaw and changed it to reflect the um, new provisions with, with respect to accessory, accessory dwelling units that's, uh, that are part of the Affordable Homes Act. Uh, but then um, I noted that the town of Rockport um, distinguished between accessory dwelling units that are part of the primary dwelling and accessory dwelling units that are completely detached from the primary dwelling unit. And, and when I was going through our um, section three of our zoning bylaw, uh, it was a little bit confusing. And, I, and I, I thought that separating those two would certainly assist the public in understanding what they can and can't do under this accessory dwelling unit bylaw. And, and as you know, uh, from the materials that were prepared by KP Law and also the materials I gave you, um, the changes to the accessory dwelling units here in Hamilton, um, I, I hate to even use the word substantial. I think they are substantial in the sense that, that, that the, uh, creating an accessory dwelling unit is as of right. Um, and also the neither the accessory dwelling unit or the um, primary dwelling unit have to be owner occupied. Those are major changes. Mm -hmm. In terms of the actual size of the units, not so much. Uh, they're about the same, you know, there are no real differences in terms of the size of the accessory dwelling unit. And also, um, uh, the 
an application for building an accessory dwelling unit is subject to site plan review. And obviously there, there, there are issues with the uh, septic and that type of thing, because, you know, you just can't put an accessory dwelling unit somewhere if you don't have the appropriate lights, appropriately sized septic system or some way of dealing with waste, wastewater. So, um, it, it, you know, this whole law might, might be a benefit to the town. I mean, it might create some smaller uh, units. It might enable people to move out of their larger house to a more efficient, smaller unit and then get income from the rental of their primary dwelling. I mean, it has potential advantages. So I, I would ask everyone, I mean, I, I now this is the second time, but at some point, the planning board itself, each member has to read through these um, uh, memos that I've done and and think, look at what we have in section three and, and their you know spillover from that. We have to make everything consistent through the remainder of the bylaw. Uh, and then um, think about how, if we wanted to, whether we would separate it into dwelling units within the ADUs within the primary residence or and ADUs that are separate from the primary residence. Um, any thoughts on that? I, I favor a separation between attached and detached ADUs, and many towns are doing that. Um, the specifics of it are a little different. Um, and it's I think it's worth looking at a few different towns to see what they've done and see what we like um, and see what seems to work. Um, that's that's my main comment. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to ask you, Jonathan, if you if you could just from your uh, work experience identify some towns uh, who have these bylaws that we could look at in addition to Rockport and Matt. Since you're a lawyer, you're going to be my go-to here. <laughs> I don't know if you would be willing to take a look at this um, the the proposed changes I made and, and also, you know, what what these other um, uh, towns have done. The, no, but no town has changed their bylaw yet. This law is very new, but it does go into effect in February 2025. So it has to um, it has to kind of get high up on the agenda. The, the problem is that the um, there is a provision for the issuance of guidelines. And so uh, you have a law that goes into effect in February of 2025, and here it is almost October, there are no guidelines. So I don't anticipate that the guidelines are going to be off the charts because the law itself is, is specific. I, I just don't know how. The only guidelines I could see is, is some type of attempt to limit site plan review, but that that doesn't make any sense. It's it's provided, um, it, you know, in the statute. And I think I left in, you know, the provisions that try to uh, keep the character of the, the dwelling unit, the accessory dwelling unit and the main house and the neighborhood all the same. But I think that could fall under site plan review. I mean, it doesn't seem appropriate to put a something that looks like a, a railroad container next to a colonial house in a in a bucolic residential neighborhood maria i was i did a little google hunting oh. and some towns have chosen don't ask me which to um wait and see like uh the law becomes the law comes into effect and um wait and see well that's and, true. and, 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 and then they have a chance to well, how is it being implemented? How is it being? And I, I it, it, I guess I, it, we don't have to prescribe it. So definitively. No, I think I think it yeah. just would be helpful to to look at, uh, especially looking at separating the uh, detached and the, hmm. you know, our, our our accessory dwelling unit uh, by law is in pretty good shape. So I think if we have it on our radar, once once we get more information, I'm thinking, you know. It's something we could get approved 
if we have enough information at annual town meeting. But I don't think it's going to be, um, it's certainly not going to be the heavy lift of the, the way it would be to amend the estate overlay district or, or uh, even the open space and farmland development um, bylaw. I don't, I don't anticipate that, but I guess the point that. is that we have some pretty meaty topics and just because I think, I think the February date looming, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily prioritize it over anything else um, until, you know, such time that it warrants it, but just being aware of the other things we're working on. Well, I'm trying to, you know, in my own mind, and I hope you all are thinking the same thing, uh, what's coming down the pike? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we have to, we have a lot of chess pieces here that, that have to come into play and we can't leave everything to the last minute and hope for the best. So, um, but this is on our plate. And is Patrick still here? See, he, he yes. messaged me saying yeah. he, he's there, but he's getting like very low percentage uh, coverage here. He's Has a, anybody a, applied for ADUs yet, or or asked about them? Could this? Patrick oh yeah, we had. Uh, <laughs> I think Brian Stein had an ADU. <laughs> And I think it's is it the ZBA who does the AB? Oh, help me here. Um, but anyhow, Brian Stein had one on Willow Street. I was just wondering if people were, you know, queued up. <laughs> no, I don't think so because you know most of the time, you know, the it it will be owner occupied. You know, I I I don't see people. I can see people doing extended families. In right, Long, you know, right, right. Well, right. In, in Woodland Mead, um, a, a couple just got permission from the ZBA to build an ADU uh, mm -hmm. for the, for their um, parents. Yeah, I, I can see that happening. I think au pairs are also, but you know, yes, we were we were always looking for. I think au pairs are a big consideration for these kind of things. Yeah, cost of childcare is so crazy now. It's like that. That's what a lot of homes are looking for. They're also popular for um, sort of uh, family compounds, helping folks age in place. Yeah, yeah. So I've done a few of them for that purpose. Yeah, I, I and and the law does provide that um, a town can um, issue regulations so that you don't have uh, Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb, <laughs> yeah, short term rentals. You can limit these uh, to prevent short-term rentals. And that's a good thing. Patrick just text messaged me to say that the, um, uh, the ZVA gets an ADU about once a month. Hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think It'll they're pretty- accelerate. <laughs> What's that? It will probably accelerate. You oh, know, young people, I, I, young I, people I can't afford their houses, how, you know, and you might have a, a parents that are retiring and, and they'll pull their resources and- and make it happen. We've yeah. also done them for um, younger folks who kind of, instead of coming back and living with parents, they come back and live again in the family compound. So for the younger generation to be in a compound or for the older generation to be in a compound. It's great. It helps with affordability and also helps with um, family support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's on our radar. And then um, Patrick did send around a memorandum from Rich Maloney with Arata. And um, I, uh, we should all read the zoning bylaw for Arata because it's there. Um, I actually, so I did, I looked at what he had proposed and I had no problem with that. Uh, whether, you know, it'll get finalized um, in the form he suggests, it, the form-based code might affect some of those provisions, but, um, when I was looking at section three, I did look at the table of use regulations. Take a look at the table of use regulations. Um, the numbers are all screwed up. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, you know, I just can't understand it. And then uh, in section 3.2.2, there's a reference to section E7 in the table of use regulations. 
but there is no Section E7. So, so there, there, there are mistakes in our zoning bylaw that we could clean up. And probably with this type of errata, that would be one um, article, if you will, at town meeting, it just solely to make, um, you know, to clean up typos and, and, and mistakes in the zoning bylaw. And that would, that would probably be um, just approved without any real discussion. So how would you go through systematically and do it? Like, for example, I know that there's one or two in the senior bylaw that are marked in my own binder here, but what would be the way that you would, you would do that systematically? Well, you'd have to read through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, what we could do is just have planning board members each take a section there are 11, two a piece. Some people might get the short end of the stick, but <laughs> we could divvy it up and just, it's just a question of proofreading. Right, and you'd have to cross-reference all the, the numbers. That's, that's the hard the, part. That's There's the a lot of page part. flipping. There's a lot of page flipping. And that's the error, for example, in senior bylaws numbers. Right, and you know, if we could get, I'll tell you how to make this easy. The, the zoning bylaw is a PDF. If we could get the, PDF converted to Word, mm -hmm. then if you make a change one place or, or you, you know that you're, you're changing one thing, then you can do find and replace. So there, there's a reference, say, to E7 somewhere else in the zoning bylaw. You can put find E7 and then replace it with nothing. But, you know, the Word functions can really help clean up an entire document without having to... Um, you know, just go page by page looking for other references. The risk would be if everybody's working on a common document, you can inadvertently create. No, we would, typos. we would, yeah, we would have to be very careful about how we did that. We would each, I think that we would each have to, um, you know, work on it ourselves and then compile them so that there was one editor who could look through everybody's changes. Right. You know, no, you know, there'd be a master document and, and everybody could, you know, just really present one person with uh, a hard copy of what they've done, as opposed to, you know, everybody inserting things in one document. So um, that covers those things. So I think um, we've made some progress, at least if we haven't made progress, we've at least started the process of making progress. Um, so turning to board business, uh, I believe um, you all uh, got um, a copy of um, an email from Joe Demolovitz, or actually it was from Patrick, forwarding you um, a copy uh, uh, of an email from Joe with respect to the litigation that's been commenced um, against the Con Conservation Commission and the, um, and the Hamilton Wenham Regional School District. Mm -hmm. So um, the gist of the complaint is that the um, order of conditions for this project expired on April 12th and the school district commenced work in June and it subsequently filed uh, an NOI, and then the uh, the Conservation Commission um, issued essentially the same orders of conditions, even though the Conservation Commission bylaw had changed in the interim. That's the that's just the short version. So the plaintiffs are seeking a, an annulment of the uh, uh, orders of conditions that were issued, I think in August and other forms of relief. So we'll have to um, stay up to speed on that. If you are interested in this litigation, I can give you the civil action number and you can go to the Superior Court uh, docket and, and I can tell you how to do that if anybody wants to know. But the civil action number is 2477 CV 00932. 
And that's a very case sensitive number. So if you put that number in the wrong way, you don't get anywhere. So the easiest way of finding this case in the docket um, is to just Google Essex Superior Court. You will get a, a, a page and it, it will say access um, state court trial dockets. And you click on that and then you have to assure the powers that be you are not a robot and then you can you know, access um, the dockets and then you can put in a search. And if you just search Hamilton Wenham Regional School District with a dash between Hamilton and Wenham, you should be able to get a copy of the docket. It will show you uh, the, the names of the lawyers who are representing the various parties and you can read through the whole um, complaint as well as the um, concomitant request for a temporary uh, restraining order and an injunction. And uh, my understanding is the hearing on the TRO and the uh, injunction is scheduled for October 1st. So uh, I will just say that th this litigation has the potential of affecting our decision. And the reason for that, and I'm not gonna get into it tonight, but the reason for that is that the um, orders of conditions that the Conservation Commission issued expired on April 12th, and our decision was issued on April 18th. So if the Superior Court were to grant the relief requested by the plaintiffs, um, the orders of conditions that were issued in August would be annulled and I would assume that the Conservation Commission would then have to revisit the NOI assessing uh, the plan sets uh, against the new Conservation Commission Bible. And, and the effect of that on what we did um, is, is, is an open question at this point. Uh, but I, I, I'm sorting through that in my own mind. But there is the potential that what we did might also uh, be affected. So that's for another day. And Patrick, I had asked you um, uh, if you could give us an update on um, uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. I don't know if you have anything um, uh, for us tonight on that regard. Yes, I have uh, touch base with uh, the town manager. He has told me that uh, earlier in the summer, the uh, select board did discuss a development agreement uh, in executive session. Uh, afterwards, separately, he and uh, the select board chair have met with uh, Scott Sundquist and the developers. Uh, and then after that, uh, the developers and they uh, had met with a half a dozen of the uh, butters uh, again earlier in the summer. Um, they are aware that uh, a development and agreement frame it, framework has to be worked on. Uh, they have been discussing it in those earlier meetings. Um, one of the points that sticks out the most is that uh, the seminary did agree to a financial contribution to deal with various types of mitigation, uh, which is uh, a first, as far as I know. Uh, I do know that the uh, uh, select board chair, uh, Caroline Beaulieu, uh, Rosie Kennedy and the town manager are working to restart the meetings with uh, uh, the rest of the group, meaning uh, John Witten, uh, also Scott Sunquist, and the uh, developers so they can get this back going. Uh, there really isn't anything concrete uh, regarding what the developers had intended for a uh, permitting approach. They did discuss the notion of an overlay uh, when we met with the neighbors. I guess that's been a couple of 
weeks ago now, uh, but we have nothing formal from them. Right. Well, uh, I here's my cautionary tale. Um, if an overlay district is comes back before the planning board, the sooner the better. I, if if there's any intention of getting it done for annual town meeting. I mean, because we will have the form-based code issue potentially before us that that could engender a, a fair amount of public um, participation in that process. And so if this comes before us, we want to be able to give it the time that it deserves. I don't anticipate it will be in the same form that that our prior work product was because the seminary is int intending to stay there. But that's my, my cautionary tale, because uh, uh, as, as those of us who've been on the planning board uh, before know, we were asked to expedite our process with respect to the Browns Hill um, Overlay District and, 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 and that, um, that accelerated effort on, by the planning board um, did not bear fruit. So uh, that's that. It, it's it's a really a matter of scheduling. I, I, you know, going forward into the winter, I want to make sure that we're able to accomplish things, and we don't have everything thrown at us all at once. Sometime in um, maybe February, and we're supposed to get it all done before annual town meeting, when we meet twice a month. Yeah, Anybody? absolutely understood. Yeah, an information flow coming from the college to assist in the process has been clearly lacking all along. And in my belief, this can't go forward without them and the developers really committing to some things that need to be committed to. Right. Well, you know, I, 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 I agree with you, and um, I think that that we were under the impression that 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 the that the seminary had some financial constraints, and uh, maybe that's not the case because there certainly doesn't seem to be any um, uh, alacrity uh, with the the approach that's been taken. Because in my mind, I haven't actually done all the math. But in December 19th, 2023, the planning board voted to pause its efforts uh, to enable the seminary and um, the um, select board and you know any potential developer, I guess, to negotiate development agreements. And that process has taken longer than what the planning board um, had done with respect to the overlay district. And, and I won't say any more. So um, does anybody else have any um, matters that they wish um, to bring to the attention of the board? And I, it looks like we have one person, Marsha Smith, who's been watching, and I don't know if she is um, wants to say anything or not. Yeah, hi. No, I, I um, what what well, starting me on the agenda was um, the first item that was published on status report on the comprehensive plan for the town center. And I actually, I, I live um, in the downtown area. So I was just wondering if there was any, any news or any update on that. Well, I apologize. I, I made some notes on the uh, agenda and, and I uh, neglected to bring that up, but I don't believe there's anything new, but Jonathan, maybe you can enlighten us. There, there is nothing new at this point to report until the, um, there's the joint meeting with the consultant in the town, the library at the end of the month. So that's the next item on the, on I think the, that's uh, September activity. 30th. Yes. Right. Monday, the 30th. Yes. Okay. Very good. And Thank did, you. Did, uh, did we look into what Pat Norton had asked about trying to move that back? Time. Yeah. Patrick, were you able to do that, move it from 6.30 to 7.30 or something like that, or at least 7? I don't know. It doesn't even look like. I think the Hamilton, I think Pat is, Patrick is gone. 
I don't see him on air anymore. Maybe oh, maybe he's the Hamilton Zoom. <clears throat> well, yeah, I was able to get. Uh, well, I checked on uh, uh, the tenth. Unfortunately, the library is not available that evening. Uh, there's a a seminar of some sort that's taking place on October the tenth. We were talking about the uh, meeting September thirtieth. Uh, September 30th. Okay. Yeah, that is to be in the library. But what time? Uh, because I think it was originally 6.30 and Pat said that's when all the kids are playing sports. Yeah, I did ask about that. And I asked the town manager as well as the, uh, the parks and recreation director coordinator. Uh, he told me that Generally, every single night of the week, uh, you are going to have a conflict. So the town manager told me to stick with what I had. I think the request had been to put it later in the night, not a different night. Yeah, if it was at 7 o'clock, I mean, it's getting, obviously it's getting darker earlier every day. And um, practices are going to probably start ending at 7 but you're right in that there is something every single night of the week. It's that the, that the night ends at seven o'clock more or less now. So I think the request wasn't so much changing the date. It was just it was changing, changing the time. The time. Yeah. Correct. So you, you want me to try for seven 30? <laughs> well, even seven, seven even seven yeah. would be uh, preferable to six 30. All right. Yeah. We Give can it a do shot. That. Give it a shot. Amazing. If it's too um, late, if it's if it's seven thirty and it's two hours, people will say, "Well, wait, our kids have to go to bed." So this is right. one advantage of not having children. You should Speaking do it. for myself. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, so no one get offended. Okay, it was just a joke. Uh, so, does anyone else have anything else uh, more to bring up? I just want to say I found the case that you uh, mentioned, and I sent it in an email to everyone if they want the link. What case? The case that you had said to go to the Essex Superior. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I sent a link to everybody yeah. if they're interested. Yeah. So they don't have to go digging. Yeah. Right. Okay. So unless there's anything else, um, I think uh, I think we've reached the end of the road here. Uh, Matt, thank you for the uh, work you did on the uh, on the inclusionary housing bylaw. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Of course. I'll I make you. a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Pat Norton? Do you want to adjourn? Pat Norton, I. Pat Norton, I. <laughs> I do. I want to adjourn. Jonathan Poor? Jonathan Poor, I. Beth Herr? I. Darcy Dale? Darcy Dale, I. And Marnie Crouch, I. Have a good evening, everyone. Yeah, good night. Good night. Bye, bye, bye everybody. Bye.